All right, our next talk is about Llama Files plus RAG. Let's welcome Jose. All right, so this talk is long, it's 45 minutes, and it's about multiple things at the same time. Normally, when you go to a talk, you want to know what is this and does it work? And I'm hopefully I'm going to be able to answer those questions. But there is more to it. There is a little bit of a worldview intermixed in the talk, and that may be too much to, to ask in the time that we have. But I'm going to tr try to communicate the worldview at the same time as I communicate how I did what I did. All right, um, just to get a feeling. Oh, one important thing. I'm going to need your help. At some point in the talk, I'm going to show code. And I'm going to need people in the audience to talk on the microphone and tell me which code they prefer or whether the code works at all. Because I'm using LLMs to generate Nick's code that may be totally nonsensical or maybe kind of OK. And we're going to compare the LLM that we train with the Nick's documentation with a vanilla LLM that anybody can access on the web, like ChatGPT 4.0. So be ready for people with a microphone to approach you if you raise your hand, and then you can comment on which version of the Nix file you like better. Right? OK, who here has already familiarity with implementing LLMs, open source LLMs? Oh, great. OK, quite a bit of people. Right. And who here has done RAC? OK, also quite a bit of people. Right, so then let's start, knowing what we know. Oh, <laughs> what happened? Ah, okay, one other important thing. If you want to follow the talk, and if you are going to read code, you better to follow the talk on your phone. There is a GitHub uh, repo that is Quesada, my last name, slash Quesada. This was supposed to be GitHub pages, but it didn't really work. Okay, now I'm getting some strange things here. Hmm. Where did the presentation go? <laughs> Interesting. So it's self-destructed, OK. Right. So one core idea of this talk is that people don't read carefully or learn things anymore. There is this gigantic growth of things like video, <laughs> and not only video, but short video. Nowadays, if you ask somebody to read a book, they go like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to read a book. And this is people who ask you for help, like, how do I learn machine learning? You send them a book, and they go like, ah, a book? What do you mean? This thing that I'm going to put on my hard drive and never open? So that's kind of the, the, st the status quo, right? And that also happens to documentation. And it happens to everybody. It happens to me. Often, you spend quite a bit of time fiddling with an LLM, trying to solve a configuration problem, only to realize that in the same time, you could have read the entire documentation for the thing, right? So people don't read anymore, which is a problem. Who reads? Machines read. So basically, if you are writing long form nowadays, assume that the only thing or person that is going to read it cover to cover is going to be a machine, which is kind of interesting. And then this opens the door to LLMs. What are LLMs? Are machines that answer questions so that you don't have to read. But then you have to trust the machine. And that is kind of interesting, because very often they hallucinate and they have proven to you that they cannot be trusted. But still, we people do trust them, and increasingly more and more. Right, so just a little bit of background about me. I run a company called Data Science Retreat that has been around for 10 years here in Berlin. We train people in machine learning and companies too. We train the Volkswagen engineers that do the self-driving car. And uh, 
to graduate, people have to present a project in public that they do solving a problem that somebody has with machine learning. So in a setting similar to this, people have to present a project that they have solved. Right, right so what is this project? Um, this is, yes, an LLM that is augmented with the documentation for Nix. And it's able to solve things like this. So this is a prompt, just asking it to configure Nginx. And given this, the reason that I mentioned that people don't read and so on, there are things to read in this talk, and this is why I gave you the link. So yeah, you can open index.html on your phone and I scroll through it. Because sometimes you may want to actually spend more time on one slide and I keep going. So this is why. So given this prompt, the machine will produce something like this. And this is done on a machine that is local, that is not a monster server, and it doesn't have much hardware. So my original idea was to do it to run on this laptop, which is an ultra portable thingy, um, without the GPU. And I had quite a bit of trouble with that, so I ended up doing it with a desktop GPU, which is not very big, it's a normal GPU. But the idea is that you should be able to move the files here and then open them on your local machine that is offline. You could be in a tropical island and you could still ask questions to the documentation and get exactly like we did here, right? So this is, what is this? Now, does it work? It's what we're going to see in the rest of the talk. And on top of that, I'm going to talk about something that is very important to me. The thing is, it's going hand in hand with the conversation that we are having about LLMs. And I think there is a, a tight change right now that, that is very beneficial for us individuals and that I think we should pay attention to. Okay, so this is the attention span of humans looking at the screen. And it's going downhill, as you can see. And this is one more reason why humans go to machines to get answers to questions instead of reading, because we cannot sustain our attention. And why is that? Because the companies, the big corporations behind the big LLMs are using them and everything else that they have, everything in the repertoire in machine learning to capture your attention, to make you pay attention to things that you don't need to pay attention to, like ads. So a ridiculous amount of compute power and brain power are invested in making this curve continue going down and making you not able to concentrate and not able to focus. And this happens also when you write code. But there, something very interesting happens. There is more code now than ever. And I think that is a problem because code simplicity is the one thing that helps us to have some guarantees to, to have secure code or to be productive. And I'm going to specify more about this. Why am I talking about security now? Because we're going to start a course on security, enhanced security retreat instead of data science retreat. But also, because it goes hand in hand with the way we are going to think during this talk. The idea here is to come back to our origins and write code with less dependencies than before. And this idea of going to a remote island with a laptop offline and still being able to, to use an LLM is useful in that sense, in the way that you are going to disconnect. And having low compute power also forces you to think differently. And this is my belief that a lot of what's going on in the security industry is not really being very helpful. So there is this conversation that, oh, now there is more code than ever, everything is big code, and this is hurting productivity because you never understand everything, all the dependencies of the thing that you are building. And this is limiting what you can do. So here, the enemy is code that you don't understand and code that you will never be able to understand, even if you had infinite time. Right now, 
when you're using servers, when you're using libraries, you're using millions of lines of code. So story time. When I started learning programming, so I'm, I'm old, I started learning C. And C was the only language that there was, pretty much. And there were maybe a couple of books or three books. Then you took one out of the library and photocopied it, because I could not afford to buy it by, by then. And then you will go sequentially through all the chapters of the book, and that's how you learn the programming language. And that's not, not how we learn nowadays, right? First, there are a trillion different languages, all with a library that is ridiculously large. Then you have these things that no one understands, which is GPUs with libraries to access the GPU that are closed source on top of it, but that are pretty complicated. And this just start piling up complexity on top of complexity. And this is, you're never going to understand everything that you're writing. And this has consequences for security, because apparently every 1,000 lines of code, there is a security bug. But also, in terms of productivity, because if you don't understand what you're building, then you're never going to, to be able to adapt to to, to make a turn what you want to, because you're basically copy-pasting copy blind, right? OK, back in the day when I was studying C, there was no Stack Overflow. There were not even books or other people to ask, or not even the internet. So everything you wrote, you understood. It may have been crap code, I'm sure it was, but you understood everything. And now you understand nothing, more so with LLMs. With elements, there's a, a level on top of a Stack Overflow. In the 2010s, people will copy paste from a Stack Overflow. Now they copy paste from LLMs. So, long story short, you want code that fits in your head. You want code that you can understand, and you want to limit the number of libraries that you, that you use to only a few. Here, here is an example. You need a cosine function. So the standard way to go, and this is also what ChatGPT does when you ask, OK, you need a cosine function. Import scikit-learn, 130k lines of code. Dependency, for example, NumPy, another 130,000 lines. That depends on some old Fortran code on Blast, and so on and so forth, and much more. This is just for one function, and I'm sure you can already see what's coming next. This is the one function that you need, the six lines. This is actually very verbose. This is what you needed. And you imported a million lines of code. Right? And this is OK. Nobody blinks an eye nowadays if this happens. Right. So why do we do that? Sooner or later, you're going to be building on top of billions of lines of code, not millions. And then, of course, say goodbye to security, say goodbye to understanding what you're doing, say goodbye to productivity. So I'm going to talk here about people that I call simplicity heroes. Do you recognize anybody in those photos? I'm going to talk about them later, so don't worry if you don't. OK, story time. NVIDIA in AI. These are uh, Ian Godfellow, Goodfellow and Andrew Eng. Andrew, Andrew New is how do you pronounce his last name. They are like super good guys in machine learning. So these guys were in a dorm in around 2010 playing video games and realized like, oh my god, things are moving so fast. Like the game industry has these cards that they use for accelerating 3D stuff. What if we use those for neural networks? They, they were neural networks researchers. They were working on their PhD around that time. Neural, neural networks at that time were pathetic. They could recognize single digits on checkbooks in, in banks and so on. They could recognize faces, but they would get confused if there's a football next to the faces, and then the football is also a face. So pretty bad. Nobody cared about neural networks at that time, except one foundation in Canada, CIFAR, that gave money to these guys to keep doing their PhDs. Then these two guys said, well, what if we stop just playing whatever they were playing, maybe World of Warcraft or whatever was popular back then, and I start trying to do the compute for the neural networks on the GPU? 
Okay, so they tried that. And then what happens is that the competition for the object recognition at the time, this ImageNet, started becoming really good. This is when people started to pay attention to, to machine learning, or, well, the journalists would call it AI, of course. So they went from here, I got 25% error rate. This is the, the task is to classify 10,000 daily, uh, daily objects, like a cab, a car, a dog. So they went from 25% error rate to less than 2 or 3% error rate. That was like, whoa, right? This doesn't happen very often. And then everything changed in the field. Everybody started using deep learning. This was called deep learning. Um, and this happened to NVIDIA evaluation, of course. Around that time, companies realized that there is, oh, that there is money to be made here, and then started buying NVIDIA cards to the point where right now there's a shortage, and you can basically not buy them. There are entire countries that are in suction, they cannot buy them because they are very valuable. Right, and this is what happened to ChatGPT in terms of compute power. So these are different versions of ChatGPT, and this is how many petaflops per second and days of compute, right? We are talking about 100,000 days running a machine of one petaflop. And you may say, well, what is a petaflop? I don't even have, a, doesn't fit in my, my brain, right? So this is a machine that gives you one petaflop, more or less. It's eight NVIDIA 4080 cards, and it costs around 40K. And this is the cheapest that you can get. Before that, you could not get a, a petaflop easily. So this is kind of scary, because imagine 100,000 days of this thing running. Of course, people who run these things at scale, they have multiple of them. But it's something that you cannot do as an individual, and that's very important. So imagine a situation where everything that is interesting to do with computers is done in monster farms of these things, and you cannot afford them. You cannot use them. You cannot, well, you can use them as a user, but you cannot create the thing that they are running. This is pretty sad, right? We don't want that to happen. And on top of that, everything is running on the product of one company, NVIDIA CUDA, that has a terrible reputation in the open source world because they basically ship binary blobs that basically nobody can get to, to work with their kernel, and, and that has been live forever, right? And there are even memes about this. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't want to use CUDA, right? And it's not only because of this, because it's hard to install and because it's closed source and so on. It's just because it's a trillion lines of code. Who, who knows how many lines of code is that that you don't control, that you don't know? So you put that into that into your machine. It could be writing letters to Kim Dong Jong. Who knows? I mean, you, you don't know what it's doing, right? So. Um, you don't want that. Okay, so this is the realization that was dawning down on me that machine learning has become a game where you cannot play as an individual. And this is a terrible feeling to have. This was around 2018, 19. Let me show you one of the projects. This is my son, Leander. I took him to our office and one of the guys there were, was working on this. This is a toy cell driving car that picks up cigarette butts. So it's basically a robot. So this was one Raspberry Pi running a very simple machine learning algorithm that detects the cigarette butts on the floor, and it will go and stab them. OK, so this is a robot. So for a boy, maybe eight years old at this time, this was amazing. This is his face when he's realizing, like, my dad builds robots. Like, wait until I tell my friends in the school, right? So at that time, I brought him there because I wanted to infect him with my enthusiasm of what it is to build things and to build things that are this cool. 
it was like having superpowers. Like, I'm going to build a toy self-driving car that picks up cigarette butts. That sounds like ridiculously cool. And he could get it as a child, right? And that feeling of, I can build things, and things that, was, that were completely impossible even two or three years ago, was kind of dissipating under the realization that now to do a state-of-the-art machine learning, you need to have these monster things. And I don't have them. I will never be able to afford that, perhaps. So then all this idea of playing and building things like this, only corporations can do now, or people working for them. And often it will be closed source, and you will not even know what it does. So you will just sit there and consume what they feed you, which is a terrible thought, right? So this is, when I said at the beginning that I was going to communicate a worldview, this is it, right? This was my feeling like, oh, this, this is not looking good around that time. But things turned around. Apparently, other corporations didn't like that one corporation, not to be named, <laughs> um, made so much progress with AI, and then they thought, well, let's do something similar and put it in the open, in the open domain, the open source world, and then people will iterate on it and will make it better. And that company was surprisingly um, Facebook, and they did. They, um, they did put something out that that was kind of comparable to the closed source things that, that people are using and getting amazed and that CEOs all over the place are now using and thinking, how can I fire people and replace them with this? So the interesting thing about these models is that they are very big, they are very hard to compute, but once the computation is done, they are just a bunch of weights. They are a bunch of floats that somebody can give you, and then you can put them in your neural network, and then you have the model. This is a first. So it's similar to the idea of open source for source code for programming languages, but in this case, you only get weights. And there are some people, Karpathy, who I didn't put in the photo of Simplicity Kings, but maybe deserving to be there, who says that programming now is done by altering weights. It's no longer done writing any kind of programming language, it's just weights the machine, and the machine learns those weights. So you program the setup so the machine can learn, and that's the program. The output is weights. Weights in, in a neural network like this. That is very interesting. Also, because you can publish those weights, and now there's a race, and all big companies that have the compute power are publishing things and trying to beat the other companies on benchmarks so that you think, oh, this company is doing a really good job. I'm going to buy their shares or whatever. For some reason, they, they are publishing weights now. Perhaps because they don't want one single company to run with it and then leave everybody else in the dust and have a monopoly. And those are companies that understand monopolies. <laughs> like they are, most of them are monopolists, right? So they don't want that to happen. So there is a company called Hugging Face that does a lot of things, but one of the things they do is that they host these big models for anybody to download. So every time that, I don't know, Google comes up with a new fantastic model, it's there. And you can w get it and download it and have it on your machine. Which leads us to Llama. So you may have heard this word now a few times. It's just a model that made by Meta that is doing quite well, and you've seen how many times it's been downloaded. It does better in some benchmarks than in others. But this was kind of the first time that an open source model was like good enough to look comparable to the closed source models that are probably optimized like hell they, the companies that train them probably pay humans to correct their mistakes by hand for probably years of labor comp comp compressed into the shortest time possible. Plus, those big closed source models 
they get your feedback. When you don't like something they do, you thumbs down or whatever it is that you use for, for that, and they learn from that, which open source models cannot do because they don't have that interface to the general public. Or if they do, they only, you only get the updates when they release a new version of the model, which is slower. Okay. So now things have changed, and all this feeling that I had, like, hmm, this is not looking good. So this story that I wanted to tell my son that you can build things was kind of getting ruined. Now it's getting back because you can do things with a off-the-shelf GPU. This is a Radeon 7900XDX that has 24 gigs of VRAM. With that, you can run pretty significant models and replicate the experience that you get from ChatGPT. And this is amazing that we can do that. This costs 1,000 euro. So it's kind of affordable enough. You could potentially get one in every home. This thing, it's eight times this, and it's 40,000K. Um, it's also running on NVIDIA. Uh, the guy who's making those is having a version with AMD and a version with NVIDIA. I pre-ordered the version with AMD, but then he had a lot of problems. And um, basically, he doesn't recommend AMD anymore. But AMD is kind of a sleeper. If they put together what they have and they play this game to win, they could do well, because their cards are better in price performance ratio than NVIDIA cards. The only problem is that the software is not great. So yeah. So basically, in running the thing that I'm presenting here, I waited for two days to just see segmentation fault. And I think it was because of the crap drivers that this thing has. But anyway. <laughs> so yeah, very uh, stressful times. Like, oh, I have a talk, and this thing is not running. <laughs> okay. Um, OK, let's start going through the people that I put in the first slides, right? Georgi Gergnanov. This is a monster programmer that wrote in C++ something that is doing the computation from the weights that you get from all these websites that I mentioned without using CUDA. So this is a few thousand lines of code, probably 10,000, I don't know, compared to CUDA, which is like a ridiculous, a very large number right? that you will never know either. And Rockem is the same thing for, for Radeon cards, AMD. So this man, one man, could replicate the work of two monster corporations that have been working on the code for dozens of years. And of course, what happened is that this is the star history of GPT-3, which, as you can imagine, it's an important thing to look at as a benchmark. And this is what happened with, with when he published his Lama C++, right? So red is Lama CPP, and blue is the actual Lama model from Facebook. So it grew past the, the model uh, from, from Facebook. And the interesting thing is you can load any model. It doesn't have to, the name is Lama CPP, CPP because it was designed for Lama, but now you can run any models. So the, the one that I've been playing with is actually from Google. It's uh, Gamma something. So um, the interesting thing is that one man wrote code that fit in his head, really doesn't fit in my head, and did something that everybody thought was impossible at that time. And once you get that, you get other people that, that are demonstrating that this approach is possible. That this idea that only corporations can play this game may not be true because of some people who are really good at what they're doing and they're taking this as their playground. Uh, Geohot, this guy, um, he is writing a library that is uh, much simpler than PyTorch and does the same. It's in alpha right now. He says that he's going to release it when it's twice as fast as PyTorch on the same hardware. He tried to get AMD on Perf ML. There's a competition for performance in ML. And he, at some point, was facing the same 
problems that I face as well, that the software is not great. And I started bitching, I don't remember if it was on YouTube or on, on Twitter, probably on both. And then the CEO of AMD got in touch with him and said, okay, what do you need? <laughs> We're going to make it happen. Just speak. And then they really started pushing this Rock M thing to a point that it now is starting to get interesting. In, he had a company called Coma AI that does self-driving car um, drivers on your phone. So you put your phone on, I think, on the back of the rear mirror facing the, the road, and it can do self-driving for any car that doesn't have self-driving car functionality on a phone. Then, um, Oh, and not happy with that, he started a computer company selling computers that are one petaflop that you can buy. And this is the, the image that I showed you before. That's called a tiny box. Fabrice Bellard, you may know him. Uh, he's probably uh, the closest thing to a god that you can be as a programmer. He wrote a C compiler in 2000 lines of code has rewritten JavaScript and made it, uh, made it have a type, uh, type system that is sound. Like, incredible things. QMU, FMMPG, a lot of stuff like that. Also, a C programmer, low level, writing very simple things in 2,000 lines of code. This is the way, th this is proving the point that you don't need to be a monster corporation with millions of lines of code to solve problems. Justin Tanay, uh, spelling error. Okay, so she took uh, Lama CPP and improved on it, on the kernels that do the computation and made it even more efficient, which nobody thought was possible. But this is also a demi-goddess of programming. She wrote something called, called Cosmopolitan, which is a uh, a glibc equivalent library that lets you run your code on any operating system and bare metal. So basically you ship uh, an exe file and you can run it on every platform. So basically things that you would think are impossible or you can run it without an operating system, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous. So this proves that you can do much more than you think. You, you are an individual, what are you going to do against Google? Well, Fabrice Bellard rewrote the, the crown jewel of Google, V8, like the JavaScript engine, perhaps, and did it better with a sound type system. One man. This woman is doing things that everybody thought were impossible. And uh, then this Lama uh, CPP inside um, Lama files, you can send somebody an executable, they double click it, and they get a chat talking to, to a model, because one of the other things she wrote is a red bean server, it's a server. So everything goes inside one zip file, and off you go. Compare that with the jokes that we had about installing NVIDIA and all the complexity of CUDA and so on. Just one executable, that's it. So this is what I use for the thing that I'm going to show you next, right? So this is just to set up the stage. So what is retrieval augmented generation? When you download one of these files with four gigabytes of weights, it's a general model. It doesn't know anything about your topic. In our case, we want it to understand Nix documentation. For that, you want to download the Nix documentation and train the model on it. Problem is you cannot train it because you don't want to run the computation again that got this four billion, or no, in this case, 8 billion weights, 8 billion weights, so 8 billion floats. You will need to recompute to represent the new knowledge. We only care about Nix. No, you cannot do that. But there is a method that lets you do the same without having to retrain the model. And this is called Rack. So you basically take your documents, cut them into small pieces, and how small that's a parameter in the model, and then represent them as vectors. This is called embeddings. How? You run into the LLM, 
and then you get a vector. Let's say that in the wiki for Nix, it says something like, uh, Nix makes trivial to share development and build environments. And I mind that this is cut. This is cut and pass through the LLM, and then you get an embedding, and then you put that into a database. This database is then going to be used to run nearest neighbors on the space of those vectors to using the cosine similarity measure that we saw in six lines of code uh, in, in C to produce a context that you're going to fit to the LLM. So now you, you the user, type a question that is, is Nix good to, to share development environments? Imagine that the general model doesn't know anything about Nix. Doing RAC, this chunk of information that is coming from the, the Nix wiki gets added to the question and a few other chunks that are the most similar to the question using this near, nearest neighbors using cosine similarity. So then the question gets augmented with all these other chunks of knowledge. And then that prompt produces an answer that is more precise than the answer that you will get otherwise. That's the whole point of uh, using RAC. So what I did was to scrape all these sources. Um, oh, I actually didn't add one. There's also a book, Nix OS in production, that I really like by Gabriela. It doesn't matter. I added that too, and that's a fantastic book. I recommend it. I have this on, on GitHub, but I'm not going to make it public until I remove that book because I don't want to put into the open domain something that is a paid book, right? So whenever I figure out how to do that, it will be public. So this was a total of 150 megabytes of text. Oh, to get the text, I ran everything through a terminal browser, links, and then when links minus dump, you get the text version. And it's much easier than doing beautiful soup or whatever it is that people do nowadays to remove HTML. So for, for a model, I use this Mistral, Mistral 7 billion parameters. And that's a 4 gigabyte file that you can get from this company called Hugging Face. So you do wget, Hugging Face, blah, 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 dot com, Mistral 7B instruct, and then you download 4 gigs of a zip file that is a llama file. And you can already execute that and get a prompt, and you can talk to the model. How amazing is that? Now there's an indexing step that you saw. So um, the database is called FICE. It's also by Facebook. And you normalize the embedding, so you pass the text. So you cut all the text in all these wikis and all these books and so on, cut them to small chunks, get vectors, normalize the vector. Embedding, when you see embedding, that's a vector. You normalize them and then add to the index. Then you have a database of vectors, and this database is designed to do approximate near and nearest neighbors, which is a very fast operation. Right, so benchmark. This is where I need your help. So can we pass the microphone around? I'm going to show code on the screen, and I'm going to show the prompt, and also the answer that NixDoc produced, that's the model that I trained, and the, model, the answer that ChatGPT produced. So I want somebody in the audience who can read Nix better than me to tell me if they are getting anywhere close to correct or not. So who wants to to, do, to first? So who wants to get the microphone and comment on the code, the solution that that this machine produced? Nobody. <laughs> uh, I'm sure everybody in this room writes better Nix code than me, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, so there we have a problem. <laughs> right. So first of all, does this code make sense? Uh, let's see. Typically, 
the URL wouldn't be just a single file, and and you would need a yeah. It, 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 but it, I guess, it would work. It's a not a fixed derivation, fixed output der derivation. You have to specify. Yeah, it's it probably wouldn't work. <laughs> it probably wouldn't. <laughs> URL uh -huh. needs a arc uh, uh, utter set, I think. And, right, right, right. But, so, but it's something fixable. Uh, well, no. <laughs> you wouldn't put it as a builder. It would be uh, that would be handled by the make derivation. Uh, so, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what ChatGPT says. It, it writes more. Right. Uh, this is this is better. <laughs> okay. Okay. So ChatGPT one uh, mixed talk zero. Okay. This is better. So this may actually even work. Right. Yeah, like okay, this is benchmark one. So one for ChatGPT, zero for uh, NixDoc. Let's try this one. Over at the package from. Okay, so here's a specific word. Yep, we do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, so let, let you read it. <laughs> uh, I, I read the title. Uh, ah, okay. So you don't need to read the, the rest, right? Okay. Uh, it okay. take me ages. So this is NixDoc. Oh, um. <laughs> Mm. No, <laughs> there is no override atters. No, uh, it makes no sense. Okay, yeah. how about ChatGPT? Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> it it does. It well, it I would override the name too because otherwise the name won't appear in the. Um, you know, when you build it, it will not have the version, the correct version in it. But it's uh, it it would do the trick, yeah. It will work. Okay, so then two zero. Let's keep going. Benchmark three, <laughs> Python three eight, <laughs> with NumPy, pandas, and Matplotlib. Create a reproducible. Okay, yeah. Uh, Next talk. Um, I don't think we even have three point eight anymore in the packages, but <laughs> yeah, a bit old. But uh, no, the list of Python, the top thing is. Um, like that that's not how you build a Python PyEnv, but it kind of gets close. Uh and you you would just need a really build env like this is no. <laughs> okay, let's see ChatGPT. Uh make shell, yeah, yeah. This works. Okay. That, that, that is Three zero. <laughs> so so far it's not doing great. But remember ChatGPT is probably billions of uh, money invested and this is basically running on a desktop or a laptop, this is kind of amazing that it gets anywhere this close, right? Yeah. So it's good to know, 3.0, let's not keep going. I have 10 more benchmarks. <laughs> <laughs> let's assume that uh, ChatGPT does better, but I would love to, to know if at any point the one that I trained does better because it will be kind of a miracle, but okay. So that's... Mm, not great. I would have liked to to have a model, have made a model that somehow does comparatively with ChatGPT, but probably not. So what have we learned? That you can create a model with weights that are floating out there on the net. You don't need petabytes of computation. You can run the model locally, even potentially on an ultra portable laptop. And this idea implies that you don't need to be a corporation to, to do things with LLMs, and individuals can play. So back to my song, right? So children nowadays, they have been born in a place that is full of machines that know a lot, and they know very little. They don't read. They don't know what files are. They only know apps. So they outsource their thinking to influencers, and to LLMs that run in the cloud that they don't own, that they don't understand, and they have no power over it. This, is, this was my fear. Now I see a way out, which is code as simple as possible with fewer dependencies, code that fits in your head, learn how to think, distrust anything that you don't understand, and run your own LLMs locally, trained on a gold standard that you trust. And this is all I have for you. Thank you. All right, we got a little bit of time for questions. I see a question here. 
Amazing talk, thank you. Uh, just a small comment, like the, you showed uh, the computer box, yeah. uh, which is basically a tiny box, and yeah. the real hero of this presentation was a Geo Hot, aka yeah. George Hotz, yeah, yeah. because he is building these things for 15K, it's not 40K. 40K yeah. is actually the big server. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So if anyone is interested in it really, uh, like the GeoHot is really trying to make you run these things at home. Yeah. And he tried to do with the AMD and then he failed. And of course he went to NVIDIA for now. But yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like a really guy who is like, has to be... So, so I went for the NVIDIA one because it's one petaflop. The, the AMD card yeah, is not one petaflop. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit... Not much, but anyway, yeah. 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 But I, I like the AMD better. I mean, I have an AMD at home, so... Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Just one comment, maybe if in the library of RAG elements, apart from the documentation, if you included Nix packages, uh, your model will know much more about how to build Nix derivation. So that would be, I think, a next step for improving the model. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah, so instead of uh, not only adding uh, documentation yeah. for your uh, model, yeah. but also uh, giving it the whole Nix packages. Yeah. So that includes uh, yeah, a lot of defini Nix definitions, Nix derivations that yeah. your model would uh, rely on. So that would, I think, improve yeah. performance. And Nix configs around yeah. GitHub, all that. I yeah. was planning to add all of this, but I didn't have time, honestly. So it's a miracle that I got this far. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna like pretty much like build off of that, because um, the well, from from what I could tell from the from the like rag model, uh, it tends to do something like really like it tends to do it really verbosely, right? It like um, the ChatGPT one was like definitely cleaner code, but it also had that problem of like really arcane code that it, like Nix beginners like find really hard to understand. Whereas that one was like really spelled out, even though it got something wrong, I could totally see myself uh, writing that code when I was starting out with Nix. I think yeah, like if you if you were to put in more like code and like put in better documentation, which is obviously like something that Nix has always struggled with, I think that one has a lot more promise than ChatGPT. I think it's just right now like the inputs aren't there. Yeah, and there's one more thing that I just realized: the prompts were generated with ChatGPT. So I asked it, "Can you generate example prompts?" So no wonder it did better, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we could do the other way around. We could ask Nixdoc to generate the prompts for ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah. All right, one last quick question. Uh, I really like that you, that you have hope in, in, the, in these times that uh, we can like, do this locally, but uh, isn't this hope a little bit flawed by the fact that uh, the actual weights you're downloading still had to be uh, generated with these huge. Uh, f first of all, the, uh, the servers generating uh, these weights had to run Q had to run CUDA. Uh, just the inference <laughs> locally doesn't use this. And also, uh, the open source model is not really super open source because actually the sources used are not open, and also the license uh, has some interesting legal stuff in there. So. Um, yeah, what, 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 what do you make out of these restrictions and that the sources are not really open? Yeah, thank you for the question. Very good question, very good point. It's absolutely correct that the people generating the weights are not telling you how they do it. And there is some magic voodoo there that nobody knows what they are doing. We don't know that, so we cannot really fully replicate it. In a way, we don't understand it. So the whole point of this is understand what you are using, right? We don't. But this is opening the door to open source LLMs. At some point, some other company will go like, we go full open source with everything. Because there is a competition now in the open to make these things work with open source philosophy. And that was huge because before you didn't have that. And then when people start playing with these things and say, well, I'm going to try one of these 8 billion parameter things on a Raspberry Pi that I'm going to stick to a camera that I put next to my son who is sleeping. Then things start happening, right? And, and I think this is overall a good thing. Of course, it would be much better if everything would be completely open source from beginning to end. We are not there yet. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker again.